Come on in, everyone. Morning. Morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Uh, we got a few minutes for class starts. Well, literally got exactly one minute for class starts, but y'all are welcome to ask me any questions while we're moving along. I'm going to make up my little open notes folder because I thought I made it up before at the end of the last class, but I did not. Hmm. How do I remain in the center? Well, that's complicated. Well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can close that and throw it away. More people coming in. Already up to 13 students, rock on. All right, got it. And it looks like we've now got 14 people in here. That's 13 students. Looks like it's good. So no one has any questions to get started? All right, last thing we did, uh, we had talked about a little bit about unit conversion, but not really enough. So I wanted to quickly go into uh, the last two sections, uh, specifically uh, estimating quantities, that sort of thing. Uh, that's a skill that you should have. And it, I've, I've mentioned it to my students before the, uh, uh, we call them Fermi calculations, F-E-R-M-I, uh, because it's an Italian pronunciation, a guy by the name of Enrico Fermi, uh, who was in many ways, sort of the end of World War II. I mean, he was probably the single one person most responsible for the end of World War II, at least the way we in, in America interpret it. Specifically, uh, there's an argument to be made that the war ended at least way faster as a result of the, those horrible bombs we created. And uh, he was the big brains behind those horrible bombs, even though there was several, several big brains. Trust me, if you read the history of the Manhattan Project, for instance, uh, American Prometheus by Kay Bird or one of those type books, you'll find out that there was actually some really brilliant minds working on the Manhattan Project, J. Robert Oppenheimer being the the head of the whole program in terms of at least the, the physicist side, uh, Leslie Groves was a, a general in the military and he was uh, actually in charge of the whole overseeing of the project, but uh, and he was a, a good dude and a very smart guy and handled very many projects, way bigger than even that one. But the physicists were all, and engineers were all working under J. Robert Oppenheimer and they had people like Hans Beth, who, uh, uh, later won the Nobel Prize. They had Richard Feynman, who later won the Nobel Prize. And in fact, one day, uh, someone was complaining to Leslie Groves about J. Robert Oppenheimer and his management. And he said, uh, one day I walked up at the Manhattan Project in, in La Los Alamos, which is some land that Robert Oppenheimer had actually more or less dedicated to the United States to let them do it, even though because he already he was very wealthy and owned a buttload of land, and that was some of it. And uh, he said, and I saw sitting at a table eating bologna sandwiches, uh, seven PhDs in their shirt sleeves. <laughs> he said, so I, I don't think I have any complaints with uh, Robert Oppenheimer's management style. If you can get seven uh, world-class PhDs to eat bologna sandwiches for lunch in shirt sleeves on a hot day, like in Los Alamos, then you're probably doing okay. So it's uh, there's some uh, pretty neat stories coming out of there. But yeah, some brilliant people. But Enrico Fermi, first... Uh, had won a Nobel Prize. He had created a physics department that was already pretty strong in, in Italy, but he made it even stronger and got it on a track where they were very attractive to various places. This was uh, around the same time that Mussolini came into power and he was running the physics department in Italy. And he had uh, written several papers, of course, and one of which was, uh, was monumental and he won the Nobel Prize for that. And because he won the Nobel Prize, the Swedes uh, you know, invited him to come there. 
and Mussolini wanting to show his system, uh, his system of government to be the superior system, he really wanted uh, Enrico Fermi to show up and accept the award. And Enrico Fermi was well, well aware of that and said, well, okay, yeah, it's no problem. I look forward to me and my family going. He said, no, 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 you can't take your family with you. And then Enrico Fermi said, well, I, I won't be going then. And finally, he talked him into letting his family go with him uh, when he won the award. So as soon as he got to basically the United States, he defected, uh, never went back. And that was exactly what Mussolini was afraid of. But he became a professor at University of Chicago. And that's why the Fermi Lab, which is named after him, is in Chicago. And uh, you'll hear stories of it, if I'm not mistaken, it was actually a lab he had set up under their football stadium, which if you know anything about, you know, University of Chicago, just like Cornell and uh, Columbia and, and some of these more elite uh, prestigious uh, universities, they don't have much of a sports program. I mean, uh, Princeton often has a decent basketball team, but that's about the extent of it. They're never going to have a good football team. Anyways, that's what their football program was. Uh, but that's actually where the first sustained nuclear reaction occurred. That was because Enrico Fermi. Enrico, or Fermi. And Enrico Fermi was the one feeding a lot of information uh, to the Manhattan Project, which uh, by and large, the physics was figured out all the way already by Enrico Fermi. Uh, uh, as, uh, excuse me, Albert Einstein uh, gave the E equals MC squared part. Uh, and then uh, various other people, Teller and uh, various other people just already knew the science. So the rest is really just an engineering project. And Enrico Fermi was over top of that. So this Enrico Fermi guy is really, really super interesting. He's one of those guys that can just look at something and say, we're going to need you know, 70,000 cars to do this. Or you're going to need 18,000 trucks to do this. He's just one of those guys that could look at things and quickly run through the variables that are relevant and give you an estimate. Uh, one of the most uh, famous ones was someone asked him how many piano tuners there were, I think, in it was like in San Francisco or something like that. And he gave a quick calculation and told him the answer and come to find out like they looked it up and, and tracked it down. And sure enough, he was off by like a couple percent. <laughs> so it's pretty impressive. So that's what these uh, calculations are about, not impressing people, but specifically being able to give back of the envelope calculations uh, a chance at getting a good first estimate of what it's going to cost you. So you might do something like, uh, let's say, I would like to uh, power the United States with solar power. Can we do that? Or do we need to, like, would we literally need to hold, cover up the whole continental U.S. with solar panels to do it? Or would we just need to take up, say, all of Texas and cover that up? Is that reasonable? Those are kind of calculations you need. Now, that one's kind of tricky because you need to have some idea of the total energy used by the United States in a given year. Uh, and then figure out, you know, how much uh, energy a solar panel can take in, which that's actually a figure I, I do generally know, uh, and stuff like that. And then you just, you know, basically calculate the area, and you'll find out it's not anything so severe as as covering up a state. It, it wouldn't even necessarily cover up, if my last checking, it wouldn't even cover up, uh, say, Connecticut. So it's, it's a very small fraction. In fact, I've often argued for covering up our interstates with roofs that were made of solar panels. Uh, if we did that alone, that would probably provide us with well over enough electricity to run the United States with complete solar panels. And it would probably reduce accidents to some extent because there would be a lot less rain and road, uh, rain and snow and stuff on the roads to cause problems. So uh, in doing such calculations, the main thing you want to do is your book often talks about trying to use one sig fig. So uh, if you think there's 27 of these items that you need to do a calculation, uh, then instead of using 27 in the, in the thing, just go ahead and call it 30. So it's got one sig fig. Uh, if it's like 23, you call it 20. And uh, another thing you can do, I got this from Larry Weinstein at ODU. He wrote a book called Guesstimation 2.0. I highly recommend that book. It's, it's actually quite, quite good. And that teaches you a lot about this estimating thing. Uh, his idea is if you really in a, in a stump as to know, you know, whether a particular dimension is this or this, he said, take the figure that you are certain it's bigger than, and then take the figure that you're certain it's smaller than, and take the geometric mean of them. So for instance, if I asked you uh, how many, let's say a common area that we have in the, at, at TCC, 
let's say the planetarium at TCC. How many fruit flies or house flies could you fit in our planetarium? Well, our planetarium's uh, about a 40 foot diameter dome. Uh, so that's the diameter. I know it's to the top is probably on average about uh, 12 feet high, something like that. So I could assume it's a cylinder of radius of, of radius 20 feet and height 12, and then just do power squared H. Of course, I'd want to convert the radius uh, and the height to meters as opposed to inches or feet or anything. I'd do that. I could calculate that volume. And then I'd just estimate the volume of a fruit fly or a house fly. Well, if you're stuck, I don't really know how big a house fly is. Well, you might say, well, I'm... I've seen house flies and they're generally bigger than a millimeter because a millimeter, I think you guys know, is, is a tenth of a centimeter. It's a, a little bit more than the thickness of a fingernail. It's about the thickness of a staple, say, just the, the actual metal making the staple. So uh, that's the smallest I could imagine. And the biggest I could imagine would be maybe half a centimeter. So half a centimeter, which would be point, uh, which would be five millimeters down to one millimeter. So what Larry Weinstein would have you do is take the one millimeter, multiply it by the five millimeters, and then take the square root of that. That's called the uh, uh, geometric mean. And then you just use that as the size for the fly. So you're not going to say the fly is the square root of five millimeters. Let's do that math real quick and reduce it to one sig fig. Uh, square root of five, of course, you all know it's about two point something. So I think that's what all we really need to almost run the wrong thing. Uh, it's 2.23. So we're going to say the fly has a width of two millimeters. We're going to say it has a height of two millimeters. And we're going to say its length is maybe one centimeter. It's one uh, centimeter. I don't know what a centimeter is, but anyways, we'll say it's one centimeter. <laughs> okay. So that's the volume of a, of a fly. I'm going to say five or excuse me, two times two times 10. That's, uh, that one centimeter sounds a little big to me. Let's, let's round it down to seven just to be sure. So I'm going to say two times two times seven millimeters. That gives me 28 cubic millimeters. Now, uh, calculating the volume of the planetarium, I would say pi r squared h. Well, I know the diameter was 40 feet is what I claim. So the radius should be 20 feet. So I'm going to say 20 times 12 would give me the number of inches. Uh, and then each inch is 2.54 centimeters. So I'm going to times 2.54. And uh, then to get the millimeters, I will multiply that by 10. And that's 6,096 millimeters is the radius. Now the height was... 12 feet, so I'll do 12 times 12. Uh, that'll give me 144 times 2.54 times 10, and that'll give me millimeters as well. So 3.14159 times 6096 times 6096. That's the uh, serve. That's the ser uh, basically the area of the bottom. And now I'm going to multiply that by the height, which would be times 12 times 12 times 2.54 times 10. That now gives me the volume, which is four times 10 to the 11th is the volume of the planetarium in cubic millimeters, which is God awful small, small number, but it's okay because I'm really using the God awful small number that is a uh, fruit fly. So what we discovered was the fruit fly, fruit fly was about 28 square millimeters. Uh, is what that worked out to be. And uh, Larry would have you go ahead and call that 30 uh, to keep it as one sig fig, and that's fine too. So we'd have four times 10 to the 11th divided by uh, three times 10 to the two. Four over three is 1.33. Uh, and then 10 to the 11th divided by 10 to the one would be 10 to the 10. So I'm going to estimate about one times 10 to the 10 or 10 billion fruit flies is what you could hold in our planetarium at TCC in Virginia Beach. So you see how we sort of went through that process? Now I've done calculations like that. For instance, I once uh, did a Google search to figure out how many miles of beach there are on the surface of the earth. 
and it'll give you some some figures back. You can find like the CIA fact book has all sorts of interesting information that might be at value. But you can find on the internet, you can find some figures that tell you the number total number of miles of ocean front, uh, beach front, if you will, on the whole planet. Now, if you assume that that beach is like a, let's say like a North Carolina beach, which is not necessarily reasonable if we're talking about like the northern part of North Carolina, that, that beach is basically on the order of 100 yards from the dune line to the water. But if you, if you assume that's the case, then you're going to say, okay, well, each beach on average will be about from the dry edge of the sand where the water just barely reaches at the highest of tides. If you run from there all the way back to the dune line, let's say that's 100 meters. And let's say the dry part of the sand starts at sea level and moves up. And it's, of course, zero right there where it's touching the water. And the height back here, maybe that's a whole meter. OK. Now you've got a triangle that's 100 meters by one meter. So the area of that triangle is 100 times one times one half, which would give you 50 cubic meters, or excuse me, 50 square meters. Now, 50 square meters is just basically sort of the cross-sectional area of that uh, piece of, of uh, real estate. But you now imagine there's a mile of that, so you multiply it by uh, basically 1,600 uh, meters. So 50 times 1,600, that would have been... Uh, 16,000, 160,000, but now it's going to be 80,000. So that's 80,000 cubic meters of sand per mile that are quote unquote dry beach sand. Okay. So that's, that's just an estimate. I don't know how accurate that is, but I, I've seen a lot of beaches smaller than hundred meters and I've seen a few beaches that are bigger than hundred meters. So it might be fairly reasonable. Uh, what we might do is use Larry Weinstein's version and say, okay, well, I certainly know it's no smaller than 100 meters. Uh, I doubt there's many more larger than 1,000 meters. So you could take the 100 meters, multiply it by 1,000 meters, and then take the square root of that, and that would give you an estimate, and that would be fine too. But then again, you just treat it like a triangle. Maybe you say it's not a meter high. Maybe it's two meters high. I don't know. But either way, you're getting a rough ballpark figure. So I know the volume of dry sand in one mile of beach is about 80,000 cubic meters. So now what I want to do is estimate the number of dry grains of sand on all of planet Earth. So I say, well, the smallest size of sand, grain of sand that I normally see, other than that, I mean, there is some stuff that's like microscopic. Uh, I think that's, I mean, it's sand in some sense, but it's, it's not. So I normally think of sand as the stuff that's at least like a millimeter thick. And maybe it might be as big as five millimeters. So you could do the quite uh, you could do the geometric mean again and do one times five. It gives you two uh, square millimeters. Uh, that's or excuse me, two millimeters, which would be roughly the diameter of the average dry grain of sand. So you take that two millimeters and notice that's the diameter. So I'm going to call that one millimeter radius and assume it's a sphere, that's four thirds pi r squared. So let's leave that. Uh, the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed, excuse me. So I'm gonna take 1.333, which is four thirds times 3.14159. Again, way, using way more figures than I need. I could have used 3.14, that would have been fine. Could have used 1.3, that would have been fine. So four thirds pi times, now I'm gonna say two millimeters cubed. And that gives me 33.5 cubic millimeters. Okay, and that's in millimeters. What I really like to do is either convert the beach sand or the beach volume to, uh, to millimeters cubed or convert this to meters cubed. I think I'm going to convert this to meters cubed. Still got people coming in. So I'm now looking at a grain of sand. I'm seeing a grain of sand takes about 33 cubic millimeters. If I want to convert that to meters, then I have to divide by a thousand for one of the meter millimeters and then divide by another thousand for another millimeter and then divide by a thousand. So I'm ended up dividing by 10 to the ninth. Uh, so I'm going to say the actual volume of a grain of sand is three times 10 to the negative eight because this tends to be 33 roughly 
uh, divided by 10 to the uh, ninth. So Q to the ninth. And that gives me, yes, three times 10 to the eighth, basically, three times 10 to the negative eight. So that's the volume of a single grain of sand, three times 10 to the negative eight cubic meters. So what I found was the beach had 80,000 cubic meters. And if I quickly, I'm going to do this on, on uh, I'm pulling up in Google behind you. I'm going to say, how many miles of beach are on Earth? 372,000 miles of coastline uh, is what science.nasa.gov tells me. So I'm going to take 300,000, uh, it's actually 3, 372,000, so I'm going to call that 400,000. So I'm going to do 400,000, that's four times 10 to the fifth, times e to the fifth, and let's check to make sure I use the right units. That was miles, and I really want to convert that to meters. Uh, actually, it gave me it in kilometers. So it's uh, six times 10 to the fifth kilometers. Let's scratch that. Then I'm not going to use the I'm not going to use the miles. It's six times 10 to the fifth kilometers, which is six times 10 to the eighth meters. So six e to the eighth meters. is the number of meters of coastline. And I know that's times 80,000 per, um, uh, well, actually I said miles. So you had already converted that to miles. So I had to use that 372, okay. So let's take, I remember since, since we had used miles, remember I, when I did that calculation of 80,000, that was 80,000 cubic meters per mile. So I really didn't need the miles. I just forgot I'd done that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that 80,000 that's 80,000 uh, cubic meters per mile times, now I'm gonna say 40,000, 400,000 miles. And that gives me 3.2 times 10 to the 10th cubic meters. I'm gonna divide that three, I'm gonna round it to three times 10 to the 10th. I'm gonna divide that by the three times 10 to the negative eight uh, that we get for the volume of a, a crust of sand, if you will. So I'm going to say divided by 3e to the negative 8. And lo and behold, I get 1 times 10 to the 18th. So with that calculation, with which, which is a pretty significant size uh, grain of sand, I get that there's roughly... 1 times 10 to the 18th, that's 1 followed by 18 zeros, dry grains of sand on all the beaches on planet Earth. That's an estimate. It's uh, actually the first time I did this calculation, I got 22, which I like better. Uh, but I was counting the smallest of the small grains of sand. So this time I chose a little bit larger grain of sand. But if I, if I consider focusing on even smaller grains of sand, I might have gone to as small as 0.1 millimeters and went up to as large as 5 millimeters and then took the geometric mean. And that, that might very well have given me closer to 10 to the 22. And the reason why I even say that is because this is a typical calculation I'll do in my astronomy class. Uh, it turns out that if you observe all the stars in our galaxy in some way or other, you'll discover that our galaxy has about one with 11 zeros after it uh, stars in it. That's 10 to the 11th, which is basically 100 billion. So there's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And then if you do a full study of the universe, at least the part of the universe we can see, starting with, say, the Hubble Deep Field photograph, you will find out that there appears to be about uh, 10 to the 11th, i.e. 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So there's 100 billion galaxies and there's 100 billion uh, stars in our galaxy and our galaxy is kind of average. So if you want to know the total number of stars in the observable universe, that's 10 to the 11th times 10 to the 11th, because it's 10 to the 11th stars per galaxy times 10 to the 11th galaxies in the universe, and you get 10 to the 22. So, or actually, yeah, 10 to the 22. 
Uh, and that actually happens to turn out to be about equal to that other calculation I did, dry grains of sand on planet Earth. Uh, and that gives you roughly an idea of, you know, how many stars in the universe there are. There, uh, and again, this is just the observable universe, which is sort of a construct centered on us. Uh, that basically the only things that that we can see, technology being no issue whatsoever, the farthest away things we can see are only things that are close enough to us that light had enough time from them to reach us. So, for instance, uh, the universe, as best we can tell, has been existing for about 13.8 billion years. So that's all the time you get for light to travel. So that means uh, the radius of the observable universe should be about 13.8 billion light years, because anything farther away than 13.8 billion light years might very well be there, but it hasn't had time for the uh, for its light to reach us. So. When we talk about the observable universe, we think of a ginormous sphere centered on us that has a radius of about 13.8 billion light years uh, in radius. OK, so that big thing right there evidently has one followed by 22 zeros after it. That's the number of uh, stars in the observable universe. And it happens to be roughly the same as the number of st uh, star or excuse me, dry grains of sand on planet Earth. If we count the smaller ones uh, than I did. Uh, now, to give you an idea, uh, you probably either have right now with you or definitely have seen a water bottle about this big. Okay. Anybody have any idea about how many uh, atoms or molecules there are in such a uh, 500 milliliter water bottle? And let's, let's make it easy. Let's make it a multiple choice. Do you think there's way fewer atoms or molecules in that bottle of water? About the same number of water molecules in that bottle of water are way more molecules of water in that bo uh, bottle of water. Anybody? Way more. Way more. Way more. In fact, you're absolutely right. Isn't that crazy? The universe, as big as it is, has so many stars that you'd have to write it down uh, using like 22 different digits. That's really freaking big, right? Uh, actually, 23 digits total. Uh, but yeah, that, that's how many stars are on the observable universe. And lo and behold, in this little container, there's um, more than a factor of 10, really, times more molecules in that 500 milliliter bottle of water then there are stars in the observable universe. And immediately you think, wow, the big is big, but I cannot believe how small the small is. So that's kind of neat. Those are some of the types of uh, approximations, rapid calculations, estimations you should do. We try to work with one at most two sig figs, but uh, really it's best to use just one. When you're in doubt, uh, try to think of the smallest it could possibly be and the biggest it could possibly be, and then take the geometric mean. You'll see when you start taking the practice tests uh, and some of the homework problems that uh, there'll be questions like, you know, uh, how many times does a human's heart beat in their life? That's, that's, that's a reasonable one. Or how tall would a stack of $1 billion bill, $1 bills be? Stuff like that. Uh, during, uh, let's say, during the Jurassic era, uh, how many times did the sun go around the Earth? Or during uh, the Pleistocene, how many times did our solar system go around the center of our Milky Way? Little stuff like that, which some of them require you to look up stuff, which I don't find quite as, as nice as the ones where you can sort of estimate it. Like a typical problem I did with my students is I took our physics textbook, the Giancoli textbook, and I laid it on the desk. And I said, okay, this book has 1,296 pages. You guys uh, calculate the thickness of one piece of paper, of one page. And that's a good estimate because you can look at it. You can you can see from across the room. I'm not letting you go measure it. I want you to be able to estimate that like in centimeters or millimeters or whatever. You can estimate how thick that book is just by looking at it. 
And you now know the number of pages in there. You might even be smart enough to realize that uh, each page is a front and a back. So you don't want to divide it by 1,296, for instance, uh, and stuff like that. And then you can immediately give me the thickness of a piece of paper. OK, so those are the types of estimation questions we want you to do. The other thing I wanted you to do is see something called dimensional and unit analysis, which we're way behind on. But I, I realized I really needed to do this. So let me let me show you the deal. So it turns out that in our system of units, there's these base units that we use. Uh, for instance, it's basically taking off the prefix in every case except for the mass. When we talk about mass, the base unit is supposed to be considered to kilogram. And that's just because a gram is really too small for everyday life. But still, uh, if you want to know what goes in between the deci and deca, that's still just a gram. It's not a kilogram. OK, now with that in mind, you can do an analysis of equations, uh, unit analysis by using the units or you can do what's called a dimensional analysis by using the dimension. So let me show you what those two things mean. So for instance, if we have mass given by the symbol M, okay, then we write the unit we'd write the unit by putting square brackets around it and we'd say kilogram. Okay, whereas if we were doing dimensions. Are we supposed to be seeing this on the screen? <laughs> yes, thank you for correcting me. I got so uh, jumped up in my, in my junk, I completely forgot to share the screen with you. Yes, thank you for doing that. Feel free to call me on that every time. Uh, your instructor's getting old. We forget things. Bear with me. <laughs> so that's pretty bad. But yes, yes, you should be seeing stuff. Thank you for catching me on that. Okay, so yes, mass, which we use, usually use the symbol lowercase m to represent. So it knows how to put the little square brackets around it. Uh, most physicists or many physicists will just use that to indicate, hey, I'm just talking about the units here, or hey, I'm just talking about the dimensions here. So in this case, I'm going to say mass. And I'm going to say M. And the dimensions are just going to be capital M. Similarly, if I say time, that's usually given the variable lowercase t, and that would be seconds. But in dimension, I'm going to call it capital T. And maybe we say length our distance is going to be X. We'd call that the meter. And this one we called the L. OK, and there's other units. Those are the three base ones. That's why they call the SI the MKS system, because you see it starts with a meter, a kilogram and a second. Uh, there's also a CGS, which is a centimeters gram second, uh, which was used as metric before we come up with the SI, uh, even though the, the SI was possible at that time. So those are ways we can do things. Now, what does this mean? What I mean is let's assume that you're in a very new branch of science and you've heard something of some other crazy scientists over in the first world that we've never met. So you're like living out in the woods in a third world country or something like that and have never actually interacted with people, but you're really smart and you're figuring out science for your own group, right? So it's a real hypothesized scenario, but you know that's, that's actually not too far off, even though there's, uh, there's a few, I think to date, we've got maybe three tribes on the entire planet that are people that haven't interacted with uh, outside humans. Uh, and, and, you know, in terms of their brain, they're, they're, just, they're exactly the same as humans. So it's not like they're less intelligent, they're just less educated by our standards, they probably run circles around us in, in their own standards. So if you imagine being in one of those scenarios where you're trying to uh, discover science anew, you might have heard some crazy guy working in the woods one day talking about Einstein, and you knew that energy had something to do with mass and the speed of light or something like that. So you might say, huh, I wonder if I can come up with a formula for energy as uh, a function of mass and the speed of light. So what we do is we'd say E equals E 
of mass and the speed of light like that. That's just, I'm using function notation. Like I would normally write F equals F of X, Y. Everybody understand what I'm writing there now? Now, in order for that to mean anything, obviously you can't add M and C because they have different units. All, all you can do is multiply M and C or raise M to a power and raise C to a power and multiply those. And the main thing is they have to have units of energy. What I will tell you is that energy has units of kilograms meters squared per second squared. That's the units of energy, okay? So with this idea and using unit analysis as opposed to dimensional analysis, which I'll do in a second, I'm going to say the units of E have to be equal to the units of mass raised to some power, let's call it X, times the unit of the speed of light raised to some power Y. And I will tell you that speed and the speed of, of light in general have units equal to meters per second. Okay. In other words, you haven't learned enough physics yet in chapter one or chapter two to know the units of energy and speed. So I would have to give you those at least for, you know, while we're in chapter one, uh, probably not in chapter two for speed, but in chapter uh, two for energy, I'd have to give you that one. But this is really the only expression it could be. Uh, you might have other terms, but those terms have to have the same units. And you might have a constant in front of it that has no units, and that's fine too. But experimental results uh, could determine what that constant is. So let's work it out. Well, the left-hand side says E is actually to the one power. Okay? If something doesn't have an exponent on it, you understand the exponent to be automatically one. So what I'm going to say is this is kilograms to the one power. This is meters to the two power. And notice a S in the bottom squared is the same thing as an S to the negative two power. Everybody follow that? I didn't lose anybody with that math, did I? All right. Now the mass has units of kilograms. So I'll write that as kilograms to the X power. And now uh, I see that the speed of light has units of mass per second, and that's going to be raised to the Y power. So that'd be M to the Y power. And then since S is in the bottom, that'll be S to the negative Y power. So all we got to do is figure out what X and Y are. Can anybody tell me right now what X must be? One. one. Exactly. One. Because the kilogram has units of one, uh, has an exponent of one on the left and uh, has a unit of X on the right. So X must be one. Check. Okay. How about a Y? Can anybody tell me what the unit of Y or the number of Y should be? Two. two. Yep, it's got to equal two. Now, just to make sure, it's got to be consistent. So S to the negative two, is that consistent with S to the negative Y? In other words, when I plug in Y equals two in, in the exponent for S, I get the same exponents on the right hand, on the left hand side, right? Yes. Okay, so yeah, that's that's a good check. So guess what? With with no knowledge of physics, with no knowledge of special relativity, you just came up with the formula E equals m c squared. Isn't that amazing? So that's the beauty of unit analysis. Dimensional analysis is the same thing, except you use those other symbols. And for instance, if you were wanting to explain something to an alien species, uh, you should both probably deal with dimensional analysis instead of unit analysis, uh, because I can guarantee you, you're not going to find an alien from a, a distant galaxy or even from a distant star system that happens to have the unit of the kilogram, right? Uh, but they'll have something that corresponds to the idea of inertia or mass, and therefore you can use the capital M from the dimension. 
So let me show you how that goes out in uh, dimensional analysis, just so you'll have an understanding. So E equals E of M and C. Uh, e would have dimensions of mass length squared over time squared, and C would have dimensions of length over time. So what we'd say is e to the one power is equal to m to the x power and c to the y power. This left-hand side would become m to the one, l to the two, s to the negative two, and this right-hand side would become uh, m to the x, and then L to the Y, and then T to the negative two. So you see, we get the same thing. This tells us that X is equal to one, that Y is equal to two, and that that works. So again, we get E equals M C squared. So that really is the difference. Does that make sense to you folks? All right, so that's the last of, sec of chapter one. I'm sorry it took so long for us to get here, but uh, there was a lot of stuff I wanted to make sure you guys knew. Hopefully y'all have now seen your syllabus, have some understanding of it. Uh, also have seen some of the videos I posted. I added some more videos to week one, as well as some more videos to week two. You're gonna need more examples than what I can give you in class and probably more examples than what you'll get from your book. Uh, those two combined used to be all we had. I mean, back before I learned about Sean's outlines, that was all the examples that I had. And then one of my teachers came in and said, well, you may, might check this book. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the most beautiful book I've ever seen. It's in this crappy old paper, this newsprint paper, but I love it. So just be advised that's, you know, sometimes you don't have that many examples and the higher you go up, there's going to be even less. So uh, just try to make use of them as well as you can. So now let's get into chapter two. And uh, does anybody have any questions on that before I move on? I don't want to go too fast, but at the same time, I do want to move on to chapter two. And we're good. Okay, so chapter two is on uh, a part of mechanics. It's the beginning of us studying physics. Uh, the chapter one was the beginning of us studying physics, but that was just getting the preliminary stuff out of the way. Uh, reminding you about things like scientific notation and significant figures. And then, of course, with, with lab, we taught you a little bit, bit about how error propagates in such a way that you really don't use sig figs for uh, real robust experimentation and, and analysis anymore. We use propagation of error. <clears throat> but it all, and it does talk a little bit about that. You'll, you'll read it talking about stuff in quadrature and delta X over X and stuff like that. So your book talked about that, but it also got us all on the same page to understand that the fundamental quantities were mass, length, and time, and that the, of course, fundamental uh, unit of mass, which we call the kilogram, is a platinum iridium cylinder uh, that's stored in Great Britain. I think it's in Great Britain. It's either Great Britain or France. I can't remember now. But anyways, it's platinum and iridium because that particular metal uh, doesn't oxidize very well. Uh, not only that, it's a very specific size of cylinder, and that's uh, one of your extra credits I put at the bottom of module one. Uh, you can calculate the surface area of a cylinder, and it's two pi r squared plus two pi r h. And then you can realize that it's made of a certain material, so the density has to be a constant. It's the fundamental mass unit, so its mass has to be a constant, namely one kilogram. So that means its volume has to be fixed, and its volume is pi r squared h. So you can take that volume equals pi r squared h and solve for h, and then plug that in for h in the surface area formula, and then you'll have surface area as if it only depends on R and the volume, the volume which you know is constant. So you've made a surface area formula that depends only on R and everything else is a constant. So the extra credit problem is for you guys to try to find the 
extrema of that because ideally if you want to minimize oxidation and stuff like that that would corrode that thing or make it change its mass over time you would want it to have it a uh, have a minimum surface area so define the minima everybody know how we did that in calculus how do we find a minima or a maxima derivatives second derivatives yeah the first derivative equal to zero that finds the extrema and when you get that, you either get a minima, a maxima, or a point of inflection. And uh, once you solve that, you'll get some relationship when you're doing this for surface area and set, take, set the derivative equal to zero, you'll get some relationship between R and V. At that time, you'll plug back in the formula for V in terms of R and H. And that allows you to solve for R purely in terms of H. So you'll get R is equal to some numerical relationship between H. And what we're hoping is that's a minimum. So that's part A of your extra credit. Part B is then to show that, in fact, that is a minimum. So now you're going to take that surface area formula again with just the R and the volume in it and take the second derivative. And then again, plug that V back in uh, so that you have it in terms of R and H. And you'll see that that either is either a clearly only a positive quantity or clearly only a negative quantity. Now, if it happens to be a positive quantity, then we know it's a minima, which is what we were shooting for. And that's all you got to prove. So that's what that was about. But that's also part of the reason why we showed you that uh, that the fundamental unit of the mass was a sample of platinum iridium held, like I said, in France or Great Britain or whatever. Uh, we also said that time uh, is in fact uh, measured by a cesium-137 clock and it makes certain uh, atomic transitions in the nucleus. And in fact, those are random events and they happen quite regularly. In fact, it's like 992 billion, 672 million, some numbers. Once it makes that number of transitions, then exactly one second has gone by. So that's our new version of the second is however long it takes cesium-137 to have that 992,792,000 such and such. Uh, and it goes on. Your book gives you the number. I would memorized it for class, but uh, that was last time. I didn't do it this time. <laughs> okay. So that's the fundamental basis for the unit of time, the second. And there's also one for the unit of length, uh, which was originally a, a platinum iridium rod that had two marks on it. And every year they would pull it out of its glass container and then pull it out of that glass container and then pull it out of that glass container and compare it to the ones that each of the continents had. And then they would quickly close it back up, make sure it's nice and clean and, and send them off to study with those. Uh, and we tried uh, hard to get rid of that. And now we've gotten rid of it. Now that we have a really good unit of time, uh, namely that 900 billion transitions of the cesium-137 nucleus, uh, we can use that to help us understand distance. It turns out that we have technology partly due to a guy by the name of, I think his uh, last name was Edgerton, if I remember correctly, at MIT. He created a, a camera that could flash every 10 to the negative ninth seconds. So we can actually take a photograph of light moving in time. With that technology, we can now say the unit of the meter is defined to be the distance that light travels in one over 299 millionths, 792 thousandths, 458 THS of a second. Okay, so if you cut down that second, which we know is some several hundred billion uh, transitions of cesium-137, if we cut that down to one, two, nine, one over 299792458 of a second, that's how uh, far a meter is. So now we have a unit of the meter, and that also forces the speed of light to be exactly 299792458 meters per second. Okay, that number I did memorize, but I did that a long time ago, so it's already stuck there. <clears throat> so that was basically what chapter one was about, then getting you the idea of estimating and unit analysis and paying attention to units. Remember, whenever you have an equation, the units on the left must equal the units on the right, the magnitude on the left must equal the magnitude on the right. And in chapter three, we'll get into vectors 
I think it's chapter three, it's three or four. Uh, and at that point, we're going to have any equation is going to have the same magnitude on the left as it has on the right, the same units it has on the left as it has on the right, and the same direction if it's a vector equation. So keeping all that in mind, we're now ready to jump to this new part of physics, which is mechanics. And that's pretty much what chapter uh, one uh, two starts us as, and that's pretty much what physics 241 is about, is mechanics. It's actually about a little bit more than mechanics. It's about mechanics. Sometimes we'll go in, uh, depending on where you're at, some people will go into thermodynamics as well. Some people will go into optics. Uh, some people will go into fluid dynamics. We leave the fluid dynamics to your engineering professors. We just go straight through mechanics, then we jump to relativity, and then we jump back to waves. OK, uh, and then in the second semester, 242, we do electricity and magnetism, jump back to thermodynamics and then jump forward to quantum mechanics. Uh, so if we can go any further, we will do nuclear physics or something like that. So with that in mind, we are now studying mechanics, which is essentially the majority of physics 241. And mechanics is made up of a couple different areas. So mechanics is the science of uh in one way it's, it's sort of the science of baseball how, how how do i one make a baseball move in other words if i want a baseball to be hit off my bat and to go over a fence uh how do i do that well you've got to give it an acceleration well what's acceleration that's defined in mechanics what's uh and that acceleration has got to result in a really high velocity well what's velocity well that's a, a definition given in dynamic or excuse me given in mechanics which is actually in the subfield of kinematics which is the same thing as the acceleration was so all that kind of stuff but then it's even bigger than that how do i make a baseball so that it's still sort of spherical even when it's being hit by uh let's say everyday ballers not not professional baseballers uh it's being hit by a metal bat uh that's something to consider what about a house? Uh, how do I build a house so that it can withstand wind? How do I build a house so that it can withstand uh, tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and stuff like that? All of those things dealing with forces causing things to accelerate, all of that's the study of mechanics. And mechanics can be broken down into a couple of parts. First off, what we're studying in this chapter is called kinematics and kinis, K-I-N-E-S, is a, it comes from the Latin, which came from the Greek, word for motion, okay? Uh, if you were in exercise in sports science or physical science or physical therapy, uh, you might not have had a, you usually do, but you might not have had a full-blown physics class. You might have had a kinesiology class. And kinesiology is basically the physics of, of your body and how it moves. So it's sort of like uh, what we're doing here, but it's just sort of the mechanics portion. So uh, the, the study of motion without understanding what caused the motion is called kinematics. So for instance, if I took a ball and I uh, saw it was moving out on the road in front of my house here, let's say I looked at it and I started my stopwatch to say zero seconds the second I looked at it, and I saw that it was moving due north uh, at 3.0 meters per second, and that its acceleration, again, you don't necessarily know what this means, but its acceleration was one meter per second every second, okay? It was going in a straight line due north. As long as the conditions that it's under stayed like that, in other words, the initial velocity was what it was, that can't change, but uh, its acceleration could really change, but if you don't change its acceleration, then I can predict at any point in time later exactly where that ball will be. And I don't have to understand anything about force to do that. I just need to understand kinematics. So that's what kinematics is, is understanding if you have a certain number of variables to begin with, like time, uh, initial velocity, and constant acceleration, or even a formula for acceleration, or even a formula for velocity, or even a formula for position, I can predict in the future exactly where it will be at any point in time, and I don't have to understand anything about forces. That's what kinematics is about. That's what this chapter is about. Once you finish that, then you can say, hey, Mr. Younger, 
this ball supposedly had an acceleration of one meter per second every second. How did it get that? Well, that requires dynamics, which is the other side of mechanics, uh, or one of the other sides of mechanics. There's also statics, for instance, and that's the study of building houses and bridges and stuff like that. But the main thing is uh, that requires us to know uh, Galileo's law of inertia, which happens to be the same thing as Newton's law of first law of motion. An object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by a net external force. That requires us to do, know Newton's second law, which says the acceleration a body of mass M will get is directly proportional to the net force acting on the body, the net external force acting on the body, divided by the mass of the body, and that acceleration will go in the direction of that net external force. And then finally, Newton's third law, uh, often written as for every action, there's equal but opposite reaction. But really all you gotta say is if object A puts a force B to the right on object, or excuse me, puts a force of five Newtons to the right on object B, then object B is gonna put a force of five Newtons on object A to the left. That's, that's basically Newton's third law, okay? So we're going to stick with the kinematics part right now. And to do that, I need you to have some understanding of some terms that we'll use. So I'm opening up to the relative reference frames and relative velocities and reference frames in general. So if I'm sitting here and, and my window is right here, I look out in the road and I see a little girl riding due north on her bike. I could, in principle, video that. Uh, I, I, just as a experimental thing, okay, I could video that and then I could analyze the video and say, okay, well, she was right here at this location on the video at 0, 0.00 seconds. And then at 3.00 seconds, she was at this point. And I could maybe indicate that as some special mark on the road with another special mark on the road. I could run out to the road and measure that distance between those two marks. That would tell me exactly how far she's traveled in that time. And if I took the time of the second dot and the time of the first dot, that would tell me how much a time has, has elapsed. So if it's been three seconds here and it's zero seconds there, three minus zero means three seconds have passed. And I might want to know, well, I wonder how fast she's going. Well, I think about my car and I say, well, my car, just like my bike, the, uh, when I was a nerdy little kid and had a speedometer on it, it had a speedometer and it had like miles per hour. So I can see that they're talking about miles, which is a unit of distance, per meaning divide uh, by an hour, which is a unit of time. So it seems to me like this concept of speed that we're dealing with is something that is measured in miles per hour or distance divided by time. So I don't know why Mr. Younger would want to give me a formula for that because I already know the formula. I know the formula speed is equal to distance traveled divided by time taken. Now in a physics class, I need to clean that up a little bit because in that three second interval, if we looked really close, or maybe if we made it a 30 second interval, it'd be more obvious. But if you looked in a bigger interval, you might find that the first tenth of the time interval, uh, the little girl moved, you know, this far. But the second tenth, she moved this far, right? And the third tenth, she moved 10 times as far. And the fourth tenth, she moved half as far as she originally did. You would then say, okay, well, this little girl's riding erratically. Her, her speed is changing from instant to instant to instant. So if I took that distance and divided by the, the that distance that she traveled in 30 seconds and divided by 30 seconds, I, I don't know how good of a representative speed that is, but it's probably not a very good one, right? So really what we're talking about when we just take the distance traveled divided by the time taken is we're talking about an average speed. And that is our definition of average speed. Uh, it's not distantly related to average velocity, uh, but I need to explain that to you too. So speed starts with an S and then there's this other quantity in uh, numbers and mathematics that starts with an S. Uh, is anybody familiar with that? If you read it already, you might know what the S and the second letter, by the way, is C, what that, what that word is. Anybody? It's an S word, second letter C, and it's another word for a number. Scalar. Scalar. There you go. So yes, speed starts with S and so does scalar. And speed is a scalar. So that's a nice little mnemonic to help us remember. And the average speed we found was distance divided by time. 
Okay. It's a scalar quantity. Now, if you've watched Despicable Me, you, the very first one, okay, that's the good one, one of my favorite movies of all time, okay? Uh, if you've watched uh, Despicable Me, you'll know that the bad guy in that was, anybody remember his name? Vector. Vector. And he said, I named myself, it's a mathematical term, and I, and I named myself that because I do evil with direction and magnitude, right? Well, that turns out to be the actual uh, a definition of a vector. A vector is a quantity that has a magnitude, which is a scalar quantity, and a direction. There's more rules to it, but that's enough, okay? So a vector is a quantity that starts with V, just like velocity does, and that's because velocity is also a vector. So there's another little wonderful mnemonic there as well to help you keep track of which is which. So yes, a vector is a quantity that has magnitude and direction. For instance, if I said the little girl was riding three miles per hour due north, uh, then I gave you her velocity. If I said the little girl was riding three miles per hour, I gave you her speed. Okay. Notice just the addition of due north was enough for you to say, oh, that must be the direction. And that's literally how they can give you a vector in a problem in this book is they can tell you their speed and then say what compass heading they're going. And that's just fine. Or they can just say at 30 degrees, and then you say, oh, well, I know from trigonometry, when they just said a number 30 degrees, what they meant is a, uh, a rotation about the z-axis from the positive x-axis towards the y-axis of 30 degrees, and it had to be counterclockwise for it to be positive. That's, that's what we're meaning here. So in physics, if they just specify a degree without a coordinate system drawn or anything else, then what they're expecting you to do is draw an XY coordinate system, take a counterclockwise rotation from the positive X axis towards the Y axis, and that'll give you a positive uh, angle. If you, on the other hand, did a clockwise down towards a negative Y, that would be a negative angle. So that's how that's gonna come to you. So that gives you some idea. Now, the other thing that's weird about that is this little girl riding by my house to me, north is that way. It's straight this way. And notice this is my left hand. So I'm wearing my watch on it and everything. So to me, that would be my negative X direction, right? So my coordinate system uh, would be the right is positive and up is positive. And therefore, I would conclude her velocity, since it's one dimensional, the, di the direction of the vector quantity is just a negative sign. The positive is just a, is just a direction as well, meaning in the right, going to the right. So her velocity would be negative three me, uh, miles per hour in my reference frame. Well, my neighbor across the street, uh, he could do physics too, that's fine. But in fact, since he's across the street, he's looking at me this way and looking at the little girl this way. He sees her moving to his right and he's likely to call that the positive X direction. So he's gonna argue that that little girl is, uh, has a velocity of positive three miles per hour. And we're both right. We have to be because uh, the there is no fundamental coordinate system that every has, everybody has to agree on. It just would be complicated to convert back and forth between his uh, his x y coordinate system and my x y coordinate system. But just know it exists. Okay. What we try to do when we're dealing with coordinate systems is we'll let one coordinate system move with respect to the other. But ideally, we'd like everybody to agree which direction is the positive x which direction is the positive Y and which direction is the positive Z. If we do that, life gets a lot easier. And that's the kind of stuff we'll do with the relative velocity stuff that we cover in chapter one here. So let me show you some of what we just talked about. So first thing, I'm gonna share my screen and notice I'm really, really smart. So I'm remembering to share the screen this time. It's very important to share the screen when you're gonna write on your document. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Y'all can laugh at me. I don't mind. It's all good. <laughs> I am smart. I let my students see what I'm writing. <laughs> okay. There's a concept, speed. And we'll give that the symbol S. And in fact, there's a concept of average speed. which we'll either use the symbol S bar, or sometimes we might even use S in brackets. And that is gonna be distance divided by time. Okay, and again, that's not a new formula, guys. That should be something that's already in your head just because you know what the units of your speedometer has. 
Okay. If you have to use a formula, by all means, that's okay. I'm just saying the more you take the things that you learn in physics and relate them to things you already knew, the less abstract and weird physics is. So if you just take the total distance someone traveled uh, uh, during a time interval and divide that distance by the time interval, you automatically get their average velocity. Now, if the situation was like I told you earlier, where I'm looking over a, a let's say a 30 second interval and the little girl comes into the right hand side of that interval and the first tenth of it she covers uh, in the first say uh, tenth of 30 seconds is three seconds. So in the first three seconds she covers like 12 meters and then in the next uh, three seconds she only covers one meter, then you know it's varying a lot in there and that average isn't going to be that valuable. So what you might want to do is figure out, well, how fast is she going at one second? Or how fast is she going at zero seconds? Or how fast is she going at 1.5 seconds? That's called the instantaneous speed. And what you would do to compute that is you say, OK, let's we're just working with this one little girl. Uh, she's uh, traveling over a time interval t equals 0, 0.0 seconds to 30.0 seconds. And that total distance she goes in that time uh, is uh, x equals 0, 0.0 meters to x equals 90.0 meters. Maybe she's got a really fast bike. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, we're going to say that's the case. Well, if we discover that in the first three seconds that she covers 12 meters. So zero to one point, or excuse me, zero to 3.0 seconds. X goes from zero to 12.0 meters. And then from 3.0 seconds to 6.0 seconds, X goes from 12 meters to 13 meters. You'd say, okay, well, that's kind of weird. She's not riding with any smoothness or sensibility. So the average over 30 seconds is not going to be very helpful to me. So what I would want to do is find a small enough time frame where if I divide the distance that she traveled by the time taken, I'll get a number. And then I'll say, okay, well, let's divide it a little smaller and divide that distance by that time. And if I get the same number, then I've evidently probably divided it small enough. Uh, if I get, for instance, one time interval, so I'm taking smaller time intervals. And we're, tr we're doing this just to try to make the average look more reasonable. Uh, and then it'll look almost like it's going at a constant speed if we make the interval smaller. So that's what I'm doing. So in one time interval, we get, let's say, uh, 3.0 meters in uh, 1.0 seconds. And what we want is this to, uh, let's say, to three decimal places. So this gave us a velocity of 3.0 meters per second. And I'll say I actually did the math and carried extra digits and it's two decimal places, okay? And in fact, I would say, oops. I would say I could actually add a couple more and say it's zero, zero meters per second. And then you take uh, the second time interval. In other words, a smaller one still. And in this case, it turned out that she went uh, 0 0.3000 meters in 0 0.1000 seconds. And that would give me again 3.000 meters per second. That would tell me my time interval was small enough. Okay. If, however, I had done one time interval and gotten, let's say, 3.124 over 1.000 meters seconds, that would give me 
3.1240 meters per second. And then second time interval, I went, uh, the little uh, girl went 0 0.3, uh, let's say 3082 in 1.000 seconds. Then I conclude the, or excuse me, that's supposed to be one followed by a, a zero, a decimal followed by one followed by a bunch of zeros. So this gives me 3.0820 meters per second. These two don't match, not to the third decimal place. Okay. But if I shrink this further, I might get that she went 0 0.0308 five over 0 0.001000 seconds. In that case, the velocity is 3.085 meters per second. And you see, it's accurate at two decimal places. If you only wanted two decimal places, you've done well enough, okay? It's sort of wrong because this second one rounds to 3.09. Uh, and the first one rounds to 3.08. So you might want to take a fourth time interval. And then you'd find that it's 0 0.003084 over 0 0.0001000 meters and seconds. And that would give me 3.08 uh, four meters per second. So we've consistently got the right answer three in a row. That means we've taken a small enough time interval. Okay. Now, what calculus would have you do is they would say S instantaneous is just equal to the limit as delta T approaches zero of distance divided by time like that. And that's exactly right. That's the derivative. <laughs> but to be honest with you, no, no computer does calculus. I mean, they symbolically do calculus when you use stuff like Mathematica and stuff like that. They know the rules so they can take, you know, y equals x squared and take the first derivative and give you 2x. In that sense, they're doing calculus. But when you're actually giving them data points and they're supposed to be doing calculus, they're actually not taking the limit because that's too difficult of a concept in some sense to program into a computer. They're just repeatedly taking smaller and smaller intervals until they get the repeatedly right answer. And that allows them to do the limiting process. So do y'all now have a feeling for uh, the difference between instantaneous speed and average speed? So if you just keep looking at it, that ratio will eventually start to settle out because there's not much change from, you know, a hundredth of a second to a thousandth of a second. You, you, you know, your reflexes, your reflexes don't move that well, so you can't change that. Now, the other thing is velocity is a vector quantity. Remember, uh, S is a scalar, which implies a number. Now, the other thing is velocity. And it's technically a vector. So to write a vector, we put an arrow over top of it like that. Uh, the big thing is there is an average one and then there's an instantaneous one as well. But the average velocity V bar or you could also write, I like this much better for obvious reasons. I could write V with the arrow symbol over it and brackets. Now this chapter, we're not really doing vectors. We're doing everything in one dimension. So the vectorness of it comes from the positive or negative side. So if I get a velocity that's negative, that means its velocity magnitude is positive, but its direction is in the negative, say X direction. Uh, if, I, if I get a positive, that means it's moving in the positive, say X direction. But I'm just sort of talking about it in vague generalities, but chapter three, we'll, we'll switch it all to be in actual vectors. Now, in this case, the average velocity is the change in X over change in time. See that, that 
uh, triangle there. That's called the delta. It's the capital Greek letter for delta. If you type a capital D in Microsoft Word, highlight it, and then change the font to symbol, you'll get that symbol. It's the Greek letter uh, delta, and delta means final minus initial. Always means that, okay? So if you have a delta T, a delta uh, S, a delta X, no matter what, it's always going to be final value minus initial value. Now, this X, which I could have used R, I could have used uh, D or whatever, this X is called the position vector. So in any scenario, you can imagine a coordinate system somewhere in that space. And if you draw a arrow leaving the origin and landing where you're at, and the head will be right there where you're at, that is your position vector, okay? So if you wanna talk about the average velocity, you have to take your final position vector minus your initial position vector, and that quantity right there is called the displacement. So that's the displacement vector is that delta X. Does that make sense? So that's how you do average velocity. And then as you might suspect, the instantaneous velocity is equal to a limit as delta T approaches zero of delta X over delta T, which I think you all can see that's just DX over DT, just like this was D, D over DT. And you can see why I didn't write it before because I used that, <laughs> that stupid D, okay? All right, so that's the fundamentals of motion. And in fact, uh, the next thing we have to do is talk about acceleration. Does anybody know of uh, the one piece of data a car salesman might give you to tell you how good a car's acceleration is? It's a particular type of data that literally sounds like a lab experiment or something. Zero to 60? Exactly, that's the one. Uh, that's the most hardcore example of acceleration. They're literally telling you the vehicle go, will go from zero miles per hour to 60 miles per hour, let's say in 4.00 seconds. That used to be really good. That was a typical Mustang or Camaro uh, uh, zero to 60 time. And I like it because four goes into 60 really easily. So the acceleration there really is just another step beyond velocity. It's the changing of the velocity divided by the time taken. So the delta V over the delta T would be 60 miles per hour minus zero miles per hour in the top. And then the delta T would be 4.0 seconds. So 60 divided by four is 15. So if it was really constant acceleration, what you'd expect is that zero seconds, the car would be going zero. After one second, it'd be going 15 miles per hour. After two seconds, it'd be going 30. After three seconds, it'd be going 45. And then finally, at four seconds, it'd be going 60. That's if the acceleration is constant. We know it's not. In fact, it's quite a bit larger at the t equals zero second than it is at the t equals three second. So in fact, it's going to go probably from zero to like 18 in the first second. And then it's going to go from 18 to say like 28 or something in the second second until it basically works out to be uh, 60 at the fourth second. But that's what acceleration is. So we can now say, average acceleration, which we can write like this, or we can write like this. And technically it's a vector quantity too, so I could put an arrow over it if I wanted. That is going to be delta V over delta T. So just like we had a delta X over delta T for velocity, acceleration is gonna give us a delta V over delta T. So an example is 60, miles per hour minus zero over 4.00 seconds equals 15 miles per hour 
per second. And that's a really nice way to express it. You express it as a number of miles per hour or a number of meters per second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or a number of meters per second or a number of kilometers per second and then divide it by a time interval. So for instance, Galileo discovered that gravity acts on all things equally such that they all accelerate at the same rate and their acceleration is 9.80 meters per second every second. Now that is mathematically exactly equivalent to 90 meters per second squared, but I really ask you, write that if you want, but I'd prefer you to write it like this, but as a bare minimum, I would ask that you say it as 90 meters per second every second, or 90 meters per second per second, because that really gives you an idea. If we went on top of that really cool tower in, in Dubai, and let's say it was, uh, uh, we sucked all the earth off the atmosphere, so there would be no air resistance, and we dropped the ball, we know from zero seconds, the time we let go of the ball, to one second, the ball would go from uh, zero meters per second to 9.8 meters per second, which by the way, is about 32 feet per second. Okay, now at the end of two seconds, it would be going in fact 19.6 meters per second or 64 feet per second. And then at the end of three, it'd be going 96 meters per second, or excuse me, feet per second. So that's the beauty of expressing the acceleration this way is you know the, the velocity is gonna change by the same amount each time interval, okay? Now, the one thing I wanna give you since we only got like one minute left is when you're comparing reference frames and you can look on the video that I made this morning, uh, there's a PHY241D01B and then it has today's date 01182023. You can look that up on my YouTube channel. That's the one I did this morning and they'll work this example out. But if you take and imagine an earth right here and you imagine a spacecraft A right here, and let's say the spacecraft is moving at three quarters the speed of light, so that VA with respect to the Earth is equal to positive three-fourths C. And then there's this other spacecraft here, B, and it's moving seven-eighths of the speed of light. Then that we would say the velocity of B relative to Earth is negative seven-eighths C. So I really should put a negative there because it's going to the left, right? Well, there's a formula you can use for relating such velocities so that if you want the velocity of object A as seen by object C, you just add the velocity of object A. Notice that matches with that. I'm going to leave that next one blank. Plus the velocity, again, I'm going to leave this one blank, but this time I'm going to make sure this matches this, so I'll put a C there. This is the way the formula is built. If you write, if you build the formula this way, you will always get it right. Okay. Now the main thing is the middle two have to have to match. So I have a VAE, so that's going to tell me to put an E here, but that forces me to put an E here as well. Now there's one more rule that goes with this, and that's VIJ is actually equal to the negative of VJI. So I don't have the velocity of the Earth with respect to ship C, but I do have the velocity of uh, ship C with respect to the Earth or something like that. So I could just flip it and put a negative in front of it. So with this particular example, if I wanted to know the velocity of object A as seen by B, I would say that's the velocity of object AE plus velocity of EB, which means the velocity of AE minus the velocity of VE. And you would end up getting uh, three fourths minus negative seven eighths times C for both of these. In other words, I just factored out the C. And that would actually give you uh, 13 eighths the speed of light, which is higher than the speed of light. That's actually the formula for adding velocities. The relativistic one, the one that's actually correct that Einstein worked on, only really works in one dimension. It gets way more complicated otherwise. 
it's still V A B plus V B C, but it's got this denominator V A B V B C over C, the speed of light squared. So uh, that's what it is in relativity. That's not something you're going to be tested on in chapter one, but you will in chapter after chapter 11. So we're done. You guys are, of course, free to go. I'll wait for the last person to leave. Please take and look at the last, uh, say, five minutes of that video on my YouTube channel. I'll show it to you really quickly while you're still here. I'm going to say share screen. Let's do that one. I think that's the right one. No, that's not the right one. That's not the right one. Ooh, what's on my screen? What's on my screen? Oh, maybe it is the right one. So that, I'm going to share screen. And now we're looking at this. Here's my YouTube channel. So reference frame, relative velocity, and speed, and velocity. That's the video I did this morning. Like, watch the last three minutes, and you'll see that example worked out. And we'll be at the same place in your class as we are in uh, my class on the uh, afternoon. Okay. So feel free to ask me any questions. I will see you guys Monday. We will finish chapter two on Monday. So make sure you've read chapter two before coming to class that day. Uh, you're free to go and ask me any questions uh, you have before you leave. Are all of the um, due dates still the same? I know last class you had mentioned moving some of them around, but I haven't yeah. seen any of them change. I wish I would. I wish you would have told me that it reminded me of that before because we got students left. Hopefully they'll see it on the video. But yes, absolutely. The stuff that was due uh, Sunday, or I might even made it to last night, 1159, I'm moving all that to be due on the 22nd. And everybody that had it done, whether they got a 28 or uh, 100, they're going to get an extra credit of 100 on a new assignment for doing it on time, even if they didn't do it well. Uh, if they got a zero, then I'm not going to give them the extra credit. But if they got something better than a zero, I'll give them the extra credit. And I'm giving them another week. So you have until the 22nd. Now, that means on the 22nd, you have uh, intro to my lab and mastering. You also have uh, uh, physics primer. Both of those are extra credit, but they're worth a lot of points. So I recommend doing them. You have chapter one homework, chapter one conceptual, and then you have chapter two homework and chapter two conceptual. Both of those are supposed to be done Sunday. I obviously didn't finish uh, chapter two, so I, I've got to push the chapter two parts back, but all that other stuff should be do, done by the 22nd. I will probably push the chapter two back until at least Wednesday, if not uh, Thursday or Friday. Okay. I have a question. Yes. The um, You're talking about the physics primer and the intro to mastering physics. Mm -hmm. There's two sets of those on the website. Yeah, There's are you talking at Canvas or are you talking about at My Lab and Mastering? In My Lab and Mastering. Okay. Yeah, so there's um, FO Physics Primer, Physics Primer, Introduction to Mastering Physics, and FO Introduction to Mastering Physics. Okay, so those were supposed to be, the FO ones were supposed to be disappearing. I hadn't I had even seen those in, in your course. That really bothers me. Uh, there might yeah, because there's be two of them due tonight. Yeah, well, the full that. intro to mastering and the physics prime is due tonight, this is. Yeah, ignore those. Uh, basically, okay. what I did today is I made two of them invisible, one physics primer and one intro to my lab and mastering. I made those invisible because I thought they were mm -hmm. only on the canvas side. Uh, if they're on the uh, my lab and mastering side, I'm going to have to change that as well. Uh, but yeah, you only have to do one. If you end up doing the wrong one, it's my job to fix it. So just do one of each of those. The deal is there's actually more points on the correct one. So like one of them's worth 86 points and the other one's worth like 77. So uh, if you see two of them that's worth, one's worth more than the other, do the one that's worth more and you'll get more points. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so if I already, did, did you say that the faux physics primer, we don't have to do? Is that what the foe was never meant to do. Yes, that that's when I fixed it last semester and thought I had taken care of it, so it'd never pop up again. But evidently, it just made a new with with a stupid name. <laughs> so yeah, you're you're definitely okay. not required to do the foe one. Okay, so how do we know which ones are for extra credit and which ones are like the the basic ones that we have to do? The only ones right now that are for extra credit are the intro and the primer. And that's only because I told you from now on out, anything that's extra credit will have an EC 
in the name or extra credit word in the name. So they're just essentially none of them be extra credit and thus they're literally labeled like extra credit. Okay. okay. Now about the extra credit, I, I did send you an email. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw it or not yet, but um, it looked like I did have access to the extra credit problem, mm -hmm. uh, but now it like disappeared. Did, was it already, is it past due? It might have been past due, but I'm going to open it back up because I know it wasn't supposed to be that way because I didn't get to talk to you uh, about it on time. So, and that's, you're talking about the week one, module one extra credit? I believe so, yes. Yeah, uh, that's probably exactly what happened. I will make sure that that is fixed so you'll have a, at least another week to do it. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Sorry about that. That's okay. So, if we did the... Um the faux intro to mastering physics we're still going to get credit for that though right yeah if uh if that's the one you did don't do another one i'll just have to transfer the score to the appropriate one and then erase that the problem is it wouldn't let me erase it last semester that's why i had to give it a new name so no one would focus on it uh and that's okay. also why i've got it here in this one and in my other class this semester so yay okay because you have you also have two physics primers on there you have one the normal one that's like 166 points and then you have the faux physics primer that's 79 points so which yeah. one is the correct one it's the one with the most points is supposed to be the correct one which is 166 uh, at least that's the way i decided this semester that i was going to create it is it took the one with the most points supposed to be worth more to you guys so that's what i made to the correct one but but trust me whichever one you do i'm going to give you the credit for it but try to do the one with the most points uh and hopefully Hopefully what I did today will make it where you can't see it anymore, but I have no idea. Okay. Well, the physics primer is due on the tonight and then the faux one is due the 22nd. All so of those are changing to the 22nd. Everything's changing to the 22nd. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Sorry about the confusion. I have a question. Um, yes. I checked Canvas and I think in I checked Cam I checked Canvas and I think I had a pop up for a lab for chapter one for this class, mm -hmm. but it wasn't for the lab portion. Was that a it, was that a bug? Yeah, I, it might have been. Yeah, I might have accidentally sent it through a, a wrong route or something. Or you're Alvin, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I might have sent it to another person who had a similar name, and that's just because your instructor's old. <laughs> okay. So old. Thanks. Have a nice week. You too. Have a good one, guys. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I have a question too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Good for uh, no, uh, go James. Ahead. And then was it Haley? Did you say you had a question too, Haley? I do, but um, there was another girl that had a question before me. Okay. Yeah, me, Alex, too. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, was it Alex? Okay. How about let's let ladies go first since we have nothing but men so far. Alex, you go first, and then Haley, and then uh, I think James was next on the male side. Okay, yep. sure. So I think I'm having a little bit of trouble with Canvas because I'm still having a hard time finding the syllabus for this class. Do you happen to know off the top of your head the test dates for this class? Yes, uh, actually, not off the top of my head, but let me share my screen with you. And in Canvas, this is your PHY 241 N01B. Uh, if you scroll down to helpful documents and links, uh, this is your H, this is your syllabus in HTML. This is your syllabus in PDF form. And if you have a problem where you don't like multiple colored text, uh, sometimes that, that aggravates people. I have another version down here that has no colors in it. You can use that. But let's pull that up for a second. And you can see my tentative dates are listed right here. So uh, online test one due, that's on 123, supposedly. Okay, all of these are tentative, of course. I've got to get a practice test up uh, like today or tomorrow in order to make this even remotely possible. Uh, <clears throat> but that's that's when that one would be. The big ones that are most important are the midterm because they got to be proctored either by you going to a testing center or you using the Respondus Lockdown Browser with Respondus Monitor. And that one's going to be during an actual class period. You can't you know take it earlier in the day or later in the day. Uh, everybody's going to take it at the same time. Uh, say roughly 5.20 p.m. that Wednesday. And the same thing with the final, that's going to be 4.26.
these other ones are more likely to change, but I'm not changing the midterm or the final. Okay. So the first test that's on uh, January 23rd, mm -hmm. does that have to be proctored or is that just going to be like something we do on Canvas or something? Yeah. If you read in the syllabus, that's that's the, one of the online tests. So you're allowed open notes, open book, open any book, and you're even allowed to do internet uh, searches. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Okay. And not only that, you get like, normally I give you three chances and only you know, your best result counts. Okay. But you got and then the midterm and the final exam will be proctored. Okay. And then we yeah. have to go actually on campus or online. Okay. Yep. Okay. No Thank you so much. Okay. I was having a hard time because um, Canvas has like a syllabus. Um, oh, yeah. Tab, like table of contents and I wasn't finding it. And I, was I like, haven't figured out how to use that yet. I had a meeting uh, at the beginning of the semester, but I never was able to make it. So I've been still using it this old school way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wonderful. So, Thank you so Haley, much. Haley, you're up next and then we'll get uh, James. Yes, um, so I just wanted to clarify um, for the homework assignments and the conceptual assignments, you want us to do those slash submit them through Canvas, right? Not in the Pearson. Yeah, so you go straight to these modules that I just clicked here. And for week one, which right now it's already shown that it's due, of course, I'm getting ready to change that, so don't worry. But you would do your homework by clicking here. And what happens is it actually does take you to my lab and mastering. But you shouldn't go to my lab and mastering from outside. If you do, I'll never get your score and it'll be a pain the whole semester. OK, so uh, yeah. then you do these problems and it automatically spits it back to my grade book. OK, and um, for the extra credit, mm -hmm. uh, do we do that through the Pearson? This extra credit? Uh, actually, no, I didn't even list it there. I don't know. Hmm. I wonder where my student saw it. Uh, he might have been from another class, though. So the extra credit is going to be, there's normally a banner here that says optional videos and then uh, lab stuff and then homework links and then extra credit. And then right here at the bottom would be the extra credit assignment. It will be right there. I will put it there and that's where you turn it in. It'll be turned in just as a, it's got to be turned in as a PDF. So you could, uh, for instance, write out the problem in hand kind of neatly take a photograph of it and convert it to a PDF and upload it there. Okay. The, if, um, you, if you don't know how to do that, let me know. There's some easy ways. Uh, and then there's some ways you can use apps that'll do it automatically. Yeah, um, I definitely, I know how to do that. Um, so I got that. So basically all of the assignments that are graded, it's just going to be done through Canvas. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's why I set up what's called a uh, deep integration. So y'all wouldn't have to go to multiple sites, hopefully. Okay, cool. Right. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, James, you're up, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, three things. Mm -hmm. the, the problem from homework one, Archimedes. All right. Uh, yeah, I hated that one. <laughs> I will have to refresh my memory and look at it again, but I I understand. Yeah. Um yeah, uh also I tried getting into Canvas last week, but I wasn't able to. Right. And you, I guess you registered I registered late, student. didn't you? Um no, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? So you had problems getting into Canvas anyways. Okay. I remember there was another student that had registered like the day after classes. So it sometimes takes a little while uh, to get you in Canvas. Uh, well, good news is uh, uh, you haven't lost anything by any missed assignments because I, I gave yeah. an extension. So uh, just mm -hmm. get her done. Yeah. Uh, also, I do have a, a two-week deployment Okay. around... It should, it's projected like at the end of April, like April 23 to May 6, which is basically Ooh, the last finals week. week. Uh, yeah. You're on, literally going to be on a ship? Um, I'm going or submarine or something Japan. like that. Gotcha. Going to Japan for a couple of weeks. Yes. I, yeah, they don't have any internet in Japan. No, it's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was going to say, if there's someone at your, uh, like in your protocol or within your chain of command or something that could administer it, we could do it that way, or we could put in an incomplete, and when you get back, we'll fix it. Don't worry, I'll work with you. You'll be fine. Okay. Uh, I think that would be all. Also, um, you do... 
uh, in-person classes, right, for 241? I do. It's at nine, or excuse me, the lab meets at 9 a.m. on Wednesdays, and usually after by 10 a.m., I'm free to ask answer questions. Uh, and then the, the actual class meets at 2 p.m. to 3.20. 2 p.m. to 3.20 on oh, Wednesday? You're 2.41. Uh, no, it's, uh, sorry, it's 12 to one twenty on uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. And the lab is uh, from 9 to 10 on Monday, or 9 to 12. Uh, yeah, I was I was going to ask if, like, maybe I could go in person sometimes. You well. absolutely can. But, I don't mind at all. So, yeah, by all means, uh, come anytime you want and do my office hours if you want. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What time is that again? I'm sorry. Uh, eight to nine, uh, actually on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah, that was all. Okay. Thanks. Uh, questions in the next room? Uh, go ahead, bud. I, I see you trying to answer, ask a question. Go for it. I don't know your name because you're in a weird window. Uh, what room was that uh, in-person lecture that you mentioned on Monday, Wednesday? Oh, on Mondays, my, uh, I do a lab at Monday from uh, 9 a.m. to 12, so you can come as early as 10 and get questions answered. But the lab start, the lecture starts at 12 if you want to attend that. And what room is that in, typically? Uh, the the lab is in JC21, and the lecture is in JC12. Okay, thanks. Okay. Man, I lost my sailor guy. I thought he was talking to me trying to get in, but uh, he just disappeared, and I forgot his first name. Crap. He was the one I was on the ship earlier. Anybody else? Yes, I do. I have a question. Go for it. So I've been I've been doing my uh, homework on uh, PSN. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, look in, I look in Canvas, and it, was, it says that uh, the grid were uh, imported or something like that. Okay. So... Uh, it sometimes it takes piece? till after midnight, and sometimes I just have to go in and, and ask it to manually update. Uh, I will I will check the grades this weekend. If I see anybody's missing, I'll let you know. But I, I bet you it'll it'll probably show tonight. Okay. Uh. So I was doing one of the the homework, and uh, I don't know if I can share my screen. Uh. Yes, I will make it so you can. Okay. Good for it. Uh, let me see. Ah, gotcha. So right here. So I, I got the answer right for the you know the mm -hmm. the algebraic part. But when I put this in, this is the formula, the expression I use to get this right. But it's rejecting this one. Let me see. Well, the units look right. Uh, that that. Uh, let me check that. This is. Uh, this might be something where uh, there's an error in the bank. I've actually worked on this system of problems for decades now. Uh, can you <laughs> scroll back so I can see what number that was? Oh, okay. Oh, this is in physics primer too, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's the prime. Okay, so solving two equations. So let me go back right here so you can see the one it is. Uh, here's the physics primer, the one that's due tonight. Right. Which that's going to switch, by the way, in case you didn't hear earlier. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's gonna yeah. Okay. Got that. Uh, click on that physics primer again so I can see which problem it was within there. And it was this one, the solving two equations. Seven. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I got it. I'll check that out. And if it is, I'll give you full credit. It, that formula looks like the one I remember deriving myself. Uh, so it might be, it might actually be correct. So we'll check that out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, can you uh, remind, remind me the dates for uh, your lecture and uh, lab, please? Sorry. Let yeah, let me, uh, here, let me type it in the chat. All right. Uh, 
Monday, Wednesday, lab, nine to 11.40, can see people by 10. Oh. Uh, Professor Younger, could I add something to this gentleman's yes, uh, answer? Uh-huh. Uh, I think he missed, he just put micro, I think it's micro sub S. Yeah, but oh, just, oh, gotcha. Yeah, you might have left off the static subscript. Yeah. Let me show a look. Okay, so I just sent you. Uh, no, I tried to. It did something crazy. JC12. So it's done by here, right? There's no yeah, way to put a. The micro S there. Yeah, subscript on the mu for the S. That that would definitely. Yeah, be I tried to copy this, but it doesn't let you paste uh, it in there. Uh, yeah, click on the mu and then click that little gray box on the top left above it, and it'll let you put in a subscript. Like here. Uh, now to the right of you. There you go. Now click on the little gray box above it. I don't get it. Uh, Over one. You were on it, but you need to go not to that. Yeah, over two, three now. The far left side of the box where the answer is. Okay. This, the box to the left. Oh, yeah, that one. Click that. That's where you actually learn how to see the subscript is the second template. See that X subscript B? Yeah, click that. Oh, okay. Just put it here and all right. Got it. Yeah, and then put an S there. And you might have to race the other one. I don't know if it's smart enough to know that's nothing. And the same thing with the mute down there. Yeah, I think that should do it. So that's yeah, definitely okay. one of the problems I've seen it mess up on. And I didn't even notice there was a subscript on it or I should have called it. No. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. No problem. Uh, submit it. See if you get the right answer and let us know. So I just... Uh, put in chat the hours of my class. Remember, I actually have a lab hour from 8 to 9 a.m. as well uh, on Monday through Thursday. Uh, this week doesn't count, of course, because I got COVID and can't go over there. So anything else, anyone? Yeah, I got a question. Is the homework typically not repeatable like the uh, conceptual side is? I, the way I set it up is I, I want uh, you to have multiple attempts when it's possible. So I didn't put any restrictions on that. Uh, but of course, when you're doing multiple choice, there's a limit to how many you can do. And then some of them, they just don't give you an extra option. Like some of them are what we call uh, randomized pro problems. If they're random randomized, I, I set it up where it allows you to do it multiple times because each time you do it, you're going to get a whole different number. So it's all a different scenario. But again, I don't, uh, I don't know on a case by case basis which homework assignments allow you, but I did set it up to allow you to do it as many times as you could. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering because I knew the conceptual one I could do. I had three attempts to do, but the uh, homework I only had one. So. Yeah, that's the, some of them. They're just limited. They can't do it. Uh, the best thing that I would recommend you you doing is not so much worry about getting the perfect scores on that. But when I put up the practice test, you want to do as many of those as you can, because those right. are actually the bank that I use for the tests. Uh, okay, thank you. No problem. I took that answer is a work. It did for the yeah, it did. Good deal. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Anybody else? And y'all are just super eager. Y'all staying here late, gonna miss lab and everything. Anyone else? Yeah, another question, Haley, or did you? Hey, did y'all see my cool painting I finally put up? The Mandalorian. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I got mad skills. <laughs> Jared, do you have a question? All right. Well, I guess I'll let everybody go. Uh, feel free to uh, email me again, text me if it's something urgent, or if you email me and don't get a response within one business day as spelled out in the syllabus, make sure you text me then. Make sure you include your first and last name and tell me that your PHY night class or two, PHY 241 night, and that would be helpful. I'm going to sign off unless anybody else has anything. See ya. Bye. Do my. Forrest Gump impression. <laughs>